this gives me great pleasure. Um, uh, Howard and I have known each other through uh, some incredibly close, close, close friends of ours, um, but never really had much of an opportunity to work together until probably six months ago, eight months ago, uh, when we were both involved in a Chicago Impact Forum. And uh, it's like we've just made up 40 years in six months. Um, but um, to, to just show you more of this divine synchronicity, um, Emmy's 1871 grandfather story is the same 1871 that Howard Tolman, the visionary behind the incubator in Chicago. So 1871 created, and I may get the number right, wrong, 495? successful startups, 495 successful startups. They operate out of the Merchandise Mart. Um, there is nowhere in the country that has had that kind of impact. And as a result of that impact, one of the things that really has driven him and embraced the two of us is his passion around the reality that most of those startups um, have very few women, black, brown owners. That, that there is no training, there is nothing underneath it. And I couldn't think of anybody better to make this transition into what we call civil society is the empowerment of our underserved communities to have the tools to do that. Um, he's being joined by Robert Smith. Robert here? Robert. Terrific. Um, were you guys planning on introducing yourselves? What do you want to do? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. yeah. Um, either way, hey, just come on. <laughs> yeah, I asked, uh, I prevailed on Chad to join us because this morning's conference and, or discussion was not really about oh. his business, and his business is so central to some of the stuff we're talking about. Yeah. I wanted him to be here as well. So first of all, let me just say, as to 1871, the number one tech incubator in the world for three years running, People ask me how it came to be named after the Chicago fire, not exactly a proud moment. Uh, and what we said was, in fact, that the representation was going forward, technology represented the new inspiration. After the fire, Chicago was rebuilt in every innovative fashion. Uh, the skyscraper was invented, the Ferris wheel, most importantly, the Tootsie Roll, an important food group. And so 1871 was the uh, core of a commitment that we had. And starting as early as our second presenter this morning, I want to say that this idea is very clear that the big companies are not going to drive innovation and disruption going forward. It couldn't be clearer. It couldn't be clearer with the Apple Watch as an example. Everything is incremental. We need to pick up and really change the world. And these three stories, what I'm so excited about is each of them represents an idea and a suggestion for you as to how you can get involved and engage in this process. So number one is we need this stuff to be driven by entrepreneurs. Number two is that entrepreneurial skills turn out to be life skills. And frankly, we're talking about preparation, perspiration. You know, we're talking about perseverance. We're talking about two other critical things, and you heard this morning as well. Entrepreneurs need to have passion, and they need to be committed to principles, because honestly, if you're just doing it for yourself, uh, you're not going to be successful. And so you want to do it for something bigger and more important than that. Uh, two quick book recommendations, one called The Future is Young, and one called What We Owe the Future. And these are both new books that are out, and again, reference this morning about the Stanford quote, you know, so interesting that we're going to have to invent the future uh, if we want to really change it. Now, my particular interest, is, as Bob alluded to, was that for 100 years, it seems like the only way out of the inner city successfully was either you were a rock star or a jock. And what I'm so excited about is in the last 10 years, it turns out that there's a new path. And that path is entrepreneurs. And we wouldn't have had the generational change and the push behind this entrepreneurial sort of drama that's going on in the cities, but for the fact that every jock today calls himself an entrepreneur as well, and every athlete calls herself uh, an entrepreneur as well. So now we've been able to do something that's really important. We have the ability to say to these kids, and by the way, sustainability, climate, very important, all going to be driven by talent. You saw the age 
and the growth of this country's population and how it's going to turn minority majority. All of these things combined to the fact that we've got wasted millions of kids who aren't getting into the system in ways that we can uh, do that. So um, our focus is paths and how do we create influencers? How do we take advantage of the fact that we've got rock stars and jocks and everybody interested in helping with the project, which is number one. Two, how do we identify and remove the stigma from vocational training? Very, very essential. We all look down on vocational training. Frankly, it's one of the strongest paths to middle class income today. It's not exportable. It's accessible. My car mechanic makes $150,000 a year. He uses a keyboard far more than a wrench. And that's just the beginning. There's a million occupations like that. So we've got three folks up here focused on uh, influencers and how we can take athletes and help them drive uh, the enthusiasm of these next couple of generations. We've got somebody focusing on vocational training and identification of career opportunities. And then we've got Chad who is driving the biggest magnet of all, which is music, okay? Because every one of these kids loves music. Music is the great unifier. And you heard that again from some of the panelists this morning. And the trick to all of this is really simple. It's to ride the horse in the direction it's already headed, okay? We're not gonna bribe these kids. We're not gonna push these kids. We have to find out what their passions are today, and we have to figure out how do we do that. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'm gonna turn it over to the guys, is my own latest idea and focus has been something we call Libraries Live. And that's because every library in this country is dying. And we need to figure out how to make those bricks and mortar and border facilities into useful for the communities. And they're everywhere in Illinois, 81 libraries in the city of Chicago, 6,400 libraries in the state of Illinois, all going to waste. So our idea is to put digital media tools, very inexpensive, in these libraries, turn them into after school community hubs and bring the kids there because I can tell you we've done this and the kids want to get done with school because they want to get on with their real life. And the real life is making beats and making music and creating digital media. And oh, by the way, once you learn to do a video, you're employable by every major corporation in this country which is engaged in the digital transformation. All media. So every one of these kids thinks that they're going to be the next Kanye they're gonna be the next anything they want. Okay, now, I'm gonna turn it over to the panel. Robert, you wanna introduce yourself? We'll just go oh, quickly. Start me first. Please. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I'll be brief from a background perspective. Uh, so Robert Smith, born and raised east side of Columbus, Ohio, um, from what most would consider to be inner city, ghetto, hood, however you wanna to refer to it, uh, where most of the friends of mine, as well as several family members, didn't make it past the age of 25. Uh, not because they were bad people, uh, but they were exposed to uh, very treacherous environments uh, that plague ultimately the majority of uh, inner cities all over the country. And so my whole way out, if you will, uh, I began to receive preferential treatment at the age of eight uh, because I excelled and did really well in sports. Fast forward, I uh, was fortunate enough to get a Division I scholarship, play college basketball, and uh, dropped out of school early to go to the NBA when my NBA dreams didn't end up working out. Uh, I was depressed, trying to figure out what I was gonna do to provide for my family. And at that time, ended up making a mistake uh, and ended up looking at facing potentially 15 years in prison for that mistake, uh, trying to get fast money. And so by the grace of God, didn't end up having to do any time, sort of slap on the wrist. A lot of people advocated for me in terms of my character and integrity and different things of that nature, and it was one mistake. Uh, and at that point in time, I made a vow, A, that I would never compromise my integrity ever again, no matter what my financial situation was. And so at around, say, 23, um, I began to immerse myself in the understanding of just, you know, financial services, asset management, high structure finance, the business and the language of money, which oftentimes, whether you're black, white, Asian, Muslim, Christian, or what have you, uh, the level of understanding money and the language around it is typically only held in a, at a Wall Street level, right? Or if you go to a major Ivy League school or what have you. 
And so a lot of friends of mine ended up making it to the NBA, to the NFL, uh, and were making hundreds of millions of dollars, some of them, all name brand folks that you would all know. But I saw that you know, what they were really ultimately missing is an understanding of the influence that they have. And so what you kind of alluded to, what we refer to as influential capital, uh, the currency of cool, right? And if we look at entrepreneurship uh, and sports and the influence that these athletes, these entertainers, uh, they almost have like a cult-like following where they can get a message out about a product in a matter of seconds uh, through social media. And something that uh, is really important is just that we sort of harness that collective raw ingenuity and influence and put it behind things that are ultimately impactful. And so I started an investment firm, um, literally from scratch, uh, purely by the grace of God, trying to make it happen. Was able to convince a lot of athletes and so forth to buy into the vision and then formed partnerships with major VCs, major private equity firms. And basically we would deploy capital right alongside them. Uh, and we built up a decent track record. And so over the past, say, three years or so, uh, myself and my partners have now launched a new impact investment firm uh, that's New Capital, Network of Untapped Entrepreneurs. Uh, and when we're talking about untapped, we're talking about that you know, powerful, unique, raw ingenuity that oftentimes in these inner cities doesn't really get identified uh, and nurtured, as well as not with the necessary capital and support that's there. Uh, but anyway, I don't, I don't want to hog the mic. I'll pass it over to you. Okay, all right. All right. Um, hey everybody, I'm Nick Gross. I uh, grew up in Southern California, and um, I would say, from my personal story, felt super lucky early on to tap into a talent and skill set through the drums and through music at a really young age. Um, you know, my focus, I think, in high school or early kind of middle school, went really quickly from, you know, knowing that I wasn't interested in school and the outcomes that school was promising me to kind of have, and thinking through those things and. It took a really big focus towards music and to, to the drums. And I uh, started my own band when I was 13 called Stool Pigeon. I still don't know today what the name even represents or even means. Um, but uh, obsessed myself with, with watching YouTube videos of this dude, Travis Barker, drummer for Blink-182, who was, you know, thankfully I was probably, I think, 12 or 13 years old at the time of this early pop punk alternative era of music happening. And, in Southern California and feel super lucky to have grown up in that place and all the bands that came from there, like No Doubt and Green Day, Blink-182, um, I mean, I don't know, this can go on forever. And uh, started my own thing and, and kind of obsessed myself with watching these videos of Travis Barker and, you know, kind of what always show up at a show is all these Blink-182 shows and just kind of immerse myself into his world. Ended up getting to take lessons with him as a 16-year-old kid because I met him at a show that my band was playing in and was driving up to his house, taking lessons with this dude. He had a show called um, MTV Meet the Barkers that I was infatuated with. And in, when I was 17 years old, a show on MTV called Laguna Beach came into my town and ended up featuring our band and, and, um, and myself in the entire third season of the show. So started to see all these kind of weird, like, you know, manifestation things kind of linking up to each other happening at a young age. And signed my first record deal when I was 17 Man, what was it? Uh, probably two weeks before I started at USC. So I had the route of, you know, I was my parents wanted me to go to school, wanted me to do the, the perfect kind of four-year college thing, like a lot of um, young people I feel like struggle with today. And dropped out of school after four months and just went to kind of pursue my passion in music. That led me to opening up a recording studio in Los Angeles um, that still is open today. I've, I've run it for the past 12 years or so, called the, the Noise Nest, and. Um, through the studio experience, I, I, I was kind of talking to my wife one day, and I was like, I want to figure out how to do something to give back to the community in Los Angeles and in Orange County. We looked at what we had access to, which was this recording studio, this little 1,200 foot studio space, and started to create quarterly events where I would bring kids through my studio space to learn what it's like to be involved in, um, in the music industry and what a career path actually means, like behind the mixing console and working in an industry that typically has been has a lot of ebbs and flows and things that happen throughout the process in music. And so um, that evolved into a national speaking tour called Find Your Grind, where I got to go speak to you know, thousands of kids about helping kids think through what it means to 
Like, what does the future of the, of the world look like? What do, what do careers and jobs look like today? How, how has the world evolved? And start to have these really pretty cool, candid conversations on multiple campuses, uh, hundreds of campuses across the country. And um, from that, kind of launched a product called Find Your Grind, which is a digital curriculum and learning solution that I work on today that I'll dive into more of and give you some time to introduce yourself, or else I'll go on a tangent for another 10 minutes about it. <laughs> uh, we all have that capability, so fortunately, <laughs> most of my introduction was earlier. I guess the thing I would add to the story I shared is uh, the origin of Guitars Over Guns um, and the experience that I had in that juvenile detention center really left me with two vivid realizations. One is that uh, these kids that, that we kind of walked in being told were dangerous, were literally a threat to us, um, were not bad kids. These were kids that had a lack of opportunities or a lack of guidance or a lack of access in a system that was kind of waiting for them to make a mistake you know, and punish them for it and, and, in a way that is not at all rehabilitative, but that cycles young people through a system uh, that they then can never get out of that, that tarnishes the rest of their life, which is, which is a reality of, of the justice system in our, in our country. Um, and the other is that as musicians, we have this unique ability to connect and reach people through music, through this universal language, this thing that we all share, that, that we all have experience with, that um, humanizes all of us. And uh, I guess the only thing I will say is that, you know, how many people in this room have had a, an influential mentor in their life? And how many of you with that mentor T you know, typically that mentor, somebody that helps you in some kind of career path has helped you with something beyond the career part of, of your life. So music is this vehicle that we use to create these relationships uh, that allow kids to find their voice and find their vision of success that they then have an individual in their life that can help them get unstuck. Number one, to hold the accountability there for, hey, this is what you said you wanted to do but number two, to walk them through situations that they otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to, to discuss with somebody that's been there. And that's really the, the key for us in Guitars Over Guns and how we're bridging the gap in, in some of the things that are relevant to this conversation. It started with you know, five musicians and 15 kids, some of which are now are on our board and on our staff uh, in 2008 and, uh, and have, has now served over, uh, this year it'll be over 7,000 kids um, in Miami and Chicago and a little bit of LA. You want to go to your slides? You want to go to your slides? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Let's see if we can make this work. Ah, there we go. So this this first slide here, I think that um, everyone, at least over the past say two and a half years or so during the global pandemic. Uh, as well as, you know, when George Floyd was demonically murdered. Um, and I think the sort of blessing in disguise through that tragic affair that we all saw and bear witness to is that it happened at a point where everyone globally, no matter your race, color, political affiliation, uh, we were all at home because of the pandemic. So being able to bear witness to that, it brought about things such as this wealth gap that exists, right? And so uh, not to make things always about money, but the reality is uh, we have to be more purposeful and more intentional in terms of these issues related to the wealth gap, most especially uh, if we want to ultimately save, you know, the youth and so forth that, uh, that Chad is talking about with guitars over guns. So this is just a slide that talks about just the massive significant disparities amongst black and brown communities and, and how we need to go about, uh, you know, changing this. This next slide here, it's pretty simple. Uh, again, prior to George Floyd, uh, there were only five states in what we all believe, what we agree that America, by show of hands, despite issues that we do have, is the greatest country in the world. What we all agree, by show of hands, don't be afraid. <laughs> Some folks are like, <laughs> right? And, and I think the, um, the beauty of this nation, it really is the diversity that we ultimately have, right? And of course, we have certain issues that are here, but every single culture of the world is represented in the United States. However, when we look at the money, that saying of he who owns the gold does what? Makes the rules. And so of all of the assets under management in this nation, the vast majority of it, nearly 98% or so, 
is managed by one representation of one type of an American, and that's white men. And so from a perspective of diversity and equity and inclusion, until that changes where there are women in powerful positions in terms of managing money, uh, people of color in powerful positions in managing money, it's going to be almost practically impossible to close this wealth gap uh, and ultimately heal the ills that are in the communities for these children to have the opportunities they need. And so what we're saying is, is that we put together this shared platform, right? Now, the verbiage behind a shared platform, I didn't create it. It has existed. Uh, it is the ultimate driving force of the innovation economy, right? It is how Silicon Valley has been birthed, right? Where you have all of these series of investors and innovators all bringing their collective resources together. So we said, let's create a shared platform that's unapologetically focused on closing this wealth gap. Uh, and the three C's that we have on the left, the first C, before we even talk about anything financial, that we believe that matters the most is this influential capital. So the currency of cool is what we call it, that athletes, celebrities, uh, that they represent, and the global influence that they have. So what we do is, is we bring together NBA players, NFL players, uh, artists and musicians. One of the organizations we work really closely with that's shown here is called BMAC. It stands for Black Music Action Coalition, uh, which came about uh, during the whole social unrest that we've all seen over the past 18 to 24 months. It's a collective of not just African-American artists, but uh, all artists in general. Justin Bieber is a member. Uh, Billie Eilish is a member. Lady Gaga. Uh, and several others who have said, hey, we want to end systemic racism in the music business. And so if you take and harness that amount of influential capital, mix and match it with the second C, which is social capital. So when we say social capital, we're not talking about social media. We're talking about things that have a social relevance and that connect us all. So corporate social responsibility. Again, what have we seen over the past two and a half years? We've seen nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars that's been announced based off of CSR related things, right? And dollars that are gonna be used to impact BIPOC communities to ultimately close the wealth gap. And then last but not least, we then get to the financial capital. Uh, and one example that we have is an organization I've been a part of for the past four or five years called the Greenwich Economic Forum. Some of you in the room may have attended our event uh, where we collectively bring together the world's most influential investment luminaries uh, Ray Dalio underwrote the whole thing for us, uh, David Rubenstein and several other private equity and hedge fund uh, investment managers to the tune of around $7 trillion or so on average that we convene in a very intimate setting. And so prior to this, uh, with New Capital as our shared platform, those three worlds, there was no convergence or intersection of the three. Athletes, entertainers, and celebrities weren't really matching and tying themselves to major corporations, corporate social responsibility efforts. And then last but not least, complemented and supported by a Warren Buffett, a Bill Gates, a Ray Dalio, and the world's largest investors, right? And so those are the three C's of capital that we have brought together uh, to then back and help support and bring visibility around the three E's that we care about. Uh, the first E, by far, I think we can all reach a general consensus that everything begins with education period. There's a good book that says people perish because of what? A lack of knowledge. So if you're not properly educated, you're not going to be equipped to even help yourself. And so the first E is education. Uh, Shooting for Peace is one of our nonprofits uh, that I sit on the board of. We've given out over the past eight years $10 million in scholarships to HBCUs. Uh, we teach financial literacy through the Shooting for Peace program all over the country. Uh, we teach mental health as well as African-American history. And there's a collective of 100 plus athletes uh, that are all behind the whole Shooting for Peace program. The next E is entrepreneurship, right? Which is primarily the thesis around what it is that we're discussing here. ICIC is one of the organizations that we work very intimately and closely with about entrepreneurship. Uh, and when we talk about entrepreneurship, I think again, we would all agree, we're not just saying uh, if you are a youth or if you are uh, a kid in college, who comes up with an innovative idea, you can be an entrepreneur. What we're talking about is just the entrepreneurial thoughts of creativity and raw ingenuity. And whether you may be a tech uh, innovator and start a company or not, 
we want to get these kids to think more entrepreneurially in terms of just being free and how they process things. The last E uh, is employment, okay? And again, in these communities, the problem is this. When, when you see a youth that's on a trajectory to death or prison based on the environment that they're in, and they have in their hands, in one hand, they have a gun. The other hand, they have crack cocaine or heroin or bath salts or ecstasy, weed, whatever the drug of choice is. So everyone in here would say, what do we need to do with those hands? Take the gun out of his hand, correct? Take the drugs out of his hand. Well, the way that he thinks or she is, this is my protection and this is how I provide for myself. So if all of the dollars are solely focused on identifying youth that are going to be innovative entrepreneurs to start a business, what about those that just need a job, right? To have access to a better quality of life. So that last E from an employment perspective is to say, well, if you uh, don't have the right entrepreneurial vision to create a business, it's our job to make sure that you're going to have a decent you know, job, if that makes sense. Uh, and so there's so many things I want to say. It's kind of difficult to put it into one sort of package. And again, not hog the mic with my brothers that are here. Uh, but ultimately, we want to bring all these collective resources together in a shared ecosystem uh, and have alignment with Guitars Over Guns and other organizations that ultimately are already doing amazing work in these communities. Uh, but yet what we've seen is, is there's no shared platform like Silicon Valley that connects all of these you know, dots, if you will. Nick, you want to say a little bit more about vocational stuff? Because it, it seems to me that uh, information, opportunity, access, all of this stuff, uh, it's really about just opening these pathways. And uh, one of the things that struck me was, and I think Julia said this before, $25,000 huge impact if applied in the correct location. I think a lot of these programs need a home. And they need, if we can find a safe space, if we can find a space like the libraries, as an example, after school where we can launch and sort of scale all these opportunities. Well, my sense is there's a million good ideas, and we aren't connecting them and scaling them uh, in ways that aren't very expensive. It's more information, influence, and direction. So go ahead. Yeah. Um, where to start with all that? I think that we, you know, talking about the concept of entrepreneurship a bit, I think the idea, at least for young people, maybe not for, you know, people in their 30s or 40s or 50s talking about being entrepreneurs, but the concept of being an entrepreneur, I feel like is this kind of exciting idea and exciting lifestyle and exciting you know, um, freedom and, you know, the idea of kind of having no boundaries and no rules and having this kind of open life to create the trajectory of what you want, um, which sounds amazing. And for a lot of people that get into it, I think learn really quickly that um, it's a lot different than that. Um, you know, I, I think the concept of entrepreneur really ties into really the culture of society in a big way, too. Like, you can take that word and plop it right into how culture in the world actually is act, it kind of how the world actually is today. And I think what's, what's been has been very linear, right? Like, school and education and how we've been preparing people has been very much about, you know, you get the perfect grades to go to the perfect college to get the perfect job, which you know, ends up being the perfect life, right? Like, that's the trajectory we've set a lot of young people on. Um, you know, I say we, you know, we, we have this 19th century system that's living in this 21st century world, right? Um, as it comes to education, but in reality, I feel like the world right now is very nonlinear, right? It's very unstructured. It's very um, fluid um, in terms of how young people are finding opportunities in terms of the amount of, you know, how frequently people are you know, moving in between jobs, right? Every three to five years, you're seeing such a, a fast speed in which kids are, are figuring things out, moving on. Um, 
the, the validation of what a college degree means today. It feels weird even saying that on Stanford's campus right now, but I'm gonna say it. I think a lot of people are waking up to the ROI and to the, the fact that degrees don't mean what they did back in the day, even 10, 10 years ago. Um, and there's new ways that brands and employers are offering quick certifications and quick ways to learn skill sets um, to get into a line of work faster that might suit your interests and your skill sets and, and um, what you're inherently great at as a human being. And so I think there's just, yeah, an ultimate kind of shift from this kind of like very linear trajectory in systems and categorization and standardization with testing and how we've set people on their path versus what culture is like today, which is completely opposite of that in terms of the new skills and the new mindsets, the social, emotional, and personal, you know, um, kind of skill sets that are more so needed today than ever. And so I think that it's important to be bringing more of those conversations and tools and products to help solve those things and to help kids with, or younger people with those kinds of mindsets and with, um, you know, getting them up to speed with what culture is like today. For kids who spend two thirds or 50% of their lives in these kind of institutions that aren't teaching them those things, I think we're doing them a huge disservice. Um, and so that's a bit of what Find Your Grind does as a digital product and a, a curriculum. We, we really help kids align with more about who they wanna be and where they wanna go. We do that through a deep dive into self-discovery and self-awareness. Um, a deep dive into career exposure and career awareness of what are the possibilities and what are the trajectories that are happening. And then third, we do, you know, we really emphasize 21st century life skills, these social, emotional, and personal development topics through an embedded experience that's personalized to the individual and can help students better understand who they want to be, where they want to go, and have that confidence to enter the world. I know I've talked a lot about young people and students, but that's where I live 16 hours of my day. Um, but, uh, yeah, I th hopefully that touches a bit on yeah. some of those things. Yeah, I, how I think I mean, about it. I think, look, I think Robert said, you know, really well, which is everybody today has to be entrepreneurial. Mm -hmm. You know, the job description entrepreneur may not be the, the driver. It's uh, between the gig economy, between COVID and remote work, everybody got a chance to catch a breath and look sort of, you know, without penalty as to the next 10 or 20 years they wanted to drive their life in what direction. And a tremendous number of these people had no clue because they had no tools, they had no ability. You push that down to kids coming out of school and it's even more critical that we help give them some direction. And I, and I think what, what Chad said about the incarcerated population, I mean, trying to recapture that whole population is tremendously critical because these are millions of people and we can't really afford to waste those resources and, and those folks going forward. So. Um, I think we can leave it there. I think we're done. Yeah, except, well, I would like to just tease one quick um, issue for Robert <clears throat> because the thing that attracted me to him in the first place, I was introduced to Robert by... It was, it was my looks, brother. It's okay. <laughs> huh? it's all, no. This is my mic. <laughs> uh, but anyway, a, uh, another terrific uh, athlete um, who's also embraced the athletic community introduced me to Robert some time ago. And um, the most novel thing that I, I think you're doing is, is the way in which you're um, actually using the curation of the private equity and the crowdfunding. Just give that a little bit of, a, of an understanding and explanation, because in my mind, that may be the most novel thing I've heard about actually getting this wealth gap closed. Yeah. So. Um... I think it's pretty simple in the sense that, you know, they say if, if statistics and things continue to trend the way that they are, it will take African Americans around 280 or so years uh, and Latino Americans around 84 uh, years to close the wealth gap. Um, when we talk about access to unique proprietary deal flow, that's usually, or not usually, excuse me, that's completely reserved for people who are already what? ultra high net worth, right? And so what we said is, is this, you know, what if we could form a strategic alignment with the series of VC, private equity, hedge fund, uh, and other investment holding company folks who have access to amazing opportunities, and we just created community-oriented partnerships. What do I mean by that? So uh, in each city where you have churches, where you have the library, where you have all these different nonprofits, that are teaching inner city folks financial literacy. 
What if we put them into small investment pools and we pull their capital together, right, in this whole democratization of capital and then permitted them a small piece of an investment opportunity that's a $200 million development deal that's already being financed by five billionaire families, right? So instead of what we're saying to all of the ultra high net worth community, yes, uh, we have charitable endeavors, endeavors where we would like folks to support financially, but more importantly, we want access to your deal flow, right? So now as you get great ROI and MOIC, this community group of 50,000 to 75,000 people who follow a Ray Lewis, who follow a Kyrie Irving, uh, a LeBron James, a Serena Williams, well, what if they could have access to the same investments that are typically just reserved, reserved for them? And in addition to that, if there was a form of an ESOP opportunity where those same people in the community, not only are they getting access to invest, but now they have access to be able to work at that job or that company that they just invested in alongside the Carlisle Group or Blackstone or Kleiner Perkins, right? And so being very intentional saying those of us who have been very blessed and fortunate to be already a part of the 1%, Let's give those who have been deemed financially poor, because they're not necessarily poor in their mind and in their spirit. Uh, so just to give some context that, and, around and that. Honestly, the first time I heard that, um, I, I just started to do some research on how much the entitlement world takes the welfare check and spends on lottery tickets. It's an incredible amount. I then found out through a bunch of independent research that crowdfunding is a bypass to the accredited investor rule. And that's a law that's been on the books since 2012. And so we can channel 200, 500, 000, I think up to $1,000. I don't know what exactly the rules are. But the point is, the vision that Robert brought to me that I, I was blown away with is that if the recipient of the capital is going to build a company, they're not only giving the crowdfunding opportunity to, the, to that mass, the 99% that aren't the Oprah pat yourself on the back because I just gave scholarship to somebody who's already a straight A student and a great athlete but the 99% who aren't seeing anything, and they're not only getting access to actual investment returns, but instead of a one in a million lottery ticket, they're getting a one in 30 or 40 or 50 really good private equity deal. A hundred lottery tickets and they're in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. And those, those numbers equate. Yes. So that's just something that I think, but yeah, one, one please. One question in the audience. Bobby. I just had a question. All right, you guys each have 20 seconds. How can this crowd be helpful to you? You can go first. Um, Pressure. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have the perfect answer to that. I don't know. I'm just looking to, and excited to meet everybody, excited to be you know, more involved in these family office type of events. And I don't know, just learn. I, I think uh, there's no real ask from my side. I don't think I'm asking anything of anybody. I'm just excited to hopefully learn from some people here. And, um, if it directly relates to education, amazing. If it doesn't, that's okay too. And I'm excited to support everyone else's vision of what they're trying to build too. So that's me. Universal. I'd say take out your phone, follow Guitars Over Guns. And if you feel so inclined, uh, invest in the organization and let me show you what's possible when we believe in these kids. I second. Ditto. <laughs> yeah, I second. Um, so w why is this panel so important? Because when we talk about civil society, it is family and community. We are family. This is community. Meet each other. This is the way we think about next generation family members who want to take their family's spirit and become entrepreneurial themselves Guess what, again, they're not gonna get it with a Stanford education. God love this place, but that's not available or accessible to the 99% of the people of the kids across the planet. But what they will understand is the same language that's being used to train and teach entrepreneurial spirit to the kids. Let's keep it in that language, as simple and practical as possible. That's the curriculum we wanna curate for Family Next Generation. This is the example and look at what it's able to do. I want my 20 seconds. Oh, Howard wants 20 seconds. 
Sorry? I would ask you to go see what the library is doing in your communities, which is every single community in the world, and exactly. you'll discover that it's an enormous waste and it's a huge opportunity. So you, that was my wrap up, but thank you for your <laughs> So, <laughs> so that's, I, I'd much rather the thunder be st stolen by the thunderer. Uh, but this library concept in Illinois has gotten tremendous appeal. Uh, Lexi Janulius looks like he's gonna be the next Secretary of State. He's very tech oriented, he's very supportive of everything Howard's doing. God knows Illinois needs this more than anybody in Chicago, even more amongst them. So great panel, thank you very much. Guys, you did a great job. <laughs>